The letter of Paul to Philemon is the shortest letter in the New Testament. It was written to Philemon and the church in his house, which was in Colossae, southwest Turkey. In the letter, Paul refers to himself as Paul the aged. It is towards the end of Paul's life and his ministry as a missionary and teacher and church planter was over and he was imprisoned for his faith. Onesimus was a slave who had run away from his master Philemon in Colossae and had travelled on foot what must have been a perilous journey of well over 1,200 miles and had meant crossing first the Aegean Sea, then the Adriatic Sea and mountains and hills to find Paul in prison in Rome. Paul leads Onesimus to faith in Jesus Christ and sends this born-again believer back to his slave master Philemon with this short letter. Philemon, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow labourer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and all the saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by you, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in times past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without your mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For have he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him for ever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved especially to me, but how much more unto thee both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how much thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord, refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, and my fellow labourers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Chained in a dark, dank dungeon, Paul looked beyond the Roman authorities, the Roman soldiers guarding him, and the prison walls to Almighty God. Paul is fixing his eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. Almighty God is in charge. The Lord reigns. The creator of the universe is in control. And having lifted his eyes to God, Paul can see his situation from the divine perspective. Paul indeed was an ambassador for Christ. 
And you can see the prison has his embassy and the Roman soldiers as his bodyguard, giving him protection while from those who wanted to kill him. Almighty God is doing something wonderful. He's working everything after the counsel of his own will and is working all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Almighty God had a glorious, perfect, divine plan and purpose for Paul in prison. For there Paul had the time to concentrate on taking dictation from the Holy Spirit and writing down what became Holy Scripture. We may never have had all those wonderful prison epistles if Paul had had his way and been out preaching the gospel. Paul had been bearing fruit as a missionary, planting churches, spreading the gospel. But now, as Jesus told us, my father is the gardener and every branch that prayers fruit he prunes. Why? So it would bear more fruit. If God has been cutting you back, limiting you, restricting you in some way, it's because he's after more fruit. So why does the shortest letter in the New Testament? What does it teach us about fruitful ministry? That was Paul was able to fulfill at least 10 glorious prison ministries from his place of confinement. And the first prison ministry, verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the ministry of blessing. It's a priestly duty. You say the right word, says God, and I will back them up with my blessing. I will put my blessing among my people when you speak words of blessing. Numbers chapter 6, verse 23. Speak to Aaron and his son, saying this. This is the way... You shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. It's a ministry I love to do whenever I meet someone or sit next to someone on the bus or in a coffee shop or in church. But remember, don't just bless your friends and family. Do as Jesus said, bless your enemies, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. That's Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Jesus said, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what St. Paul said in Romans 12, verse 21. This blessing is a form of giving. And remember, it's much better to give than receive. Give and will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be given into your lap. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Bless and be blessed, says Jesus. And what is the second prison ministry? Verse 4. I thank my God. Remember that Paul was chained and imprisoned, not knowing whether at any moment he might be fed to the lions. That hadn't been on Paul's agenda. He wanted to be out preaching the gospel far and wide. He'd had plans to visit Spain. But I love the fact that Paul was a man who practised what he preached. As he'd written to the Thessalonians, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And what did Paul tell the Corinthian church? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. He told them that the love of Christ constrains us. Giving thanks is so vital. It grieves God's heart when people grumble, as his people did grumble in the wilderness. Remember that God's chosen people, as they passed through the wilderness, were receiving seven miracles every day 
for 40 years. They had a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. They had manna from heaven. They had quails from heaven. They had water from the rock. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. I count that to be something like 24,000 miracles in the wilderness. And yet God's people grumbled. King David, a man after God's own heart, knew the power of praise. Psalm 69 verse 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. I tell people if you want to get close to God, start thanking him. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. You know what a magnifying glass does? It enables us to see things more clearly. We can be so distracted by the problems and difficulties that surround us. Focus on the Lord. Fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith, and he will complete that good work which he began in you. If we could only see the power of thanksgiving. I'd like to share this testimony about a late friend of mine, Peter. Peter, um, everything seemed to have gone wrong in his life. His wife uh, was in her late 50s, had terminal cancer, and he'd had a watcher increasingly suffer and eventually die. But not long after that, Peter was at work, and it was during the um, violent storms when uh, the roof blew off a house and blown across a road and landed on the conservatory in which Peter was working as a gardener. Thankfully, there was a wall round the bottom of the conservatory which really saved Peter's life. But he suffered con concussion and he had to go into hospital, receive many stitches. And he was really at a very low ebb. There was talk of him being made redundant. He didn't know when he would get well enough again. And Peter asked if I would go with him on a short holiday and so I agreed and we went away um, to this Christian conference centre and uh, we had a light lunch preparing ourselves for what we thought would be a lovely three course meal in the evening but when we arrived and they served the meal um, what they served was uh, poached egg on toast now, I could see uh, Peter's um, demeanour getting lower as I saw him eating the poached egg on toast. Uh, well, we got through that evening. We watched a video about the work of that conference centre. Then we said goodnight and I went to my room and prepared to go to bed when not long after a knock came on the door and it was um, Peter. And he looked so very depressed. His um, shoulders were down, his face was down, his head was dropped. He looked, should I say, as miserable as sin. And he said, Don, can you help me? And so I said, come in. And I sat him down on the chair next to my bed. And uh, we sat down and uh, I said, well, let's turn to the Lord. Let's turn to Jesus and talk to him and pray and, and cast our care upon him and give him our problems and Peter said, yes, but I can't really pray. I don't know what to pray about. I'm so depressed. Well, I started to pray, and uh, it wasn't long before the Lord started to speak to me. And he gave me a verse of scripture immediately, silently in my head. He reminded of the scripture. It's in Thessalonians. It says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's what Paul had written to the Thessalonians over 2,000 years ago. Well, uh, when I heard that verse of Scripture, I knew it was the Lord, but I started to argue with the Lord and debate with him, and I said, I, I, can't, I can't give that verse. I can't tell Peter to start giving thanks. He's just lost his wife. He's had concussion. He's just come out of hospital. There's talk of him losing his job, of him being made redundant, and... Lord, he was really hungry and they've only given him poached egg on toast, Lord. I can't ask him to start giving thanks now. But you know what happens 
when you start arguing with the God. You know who's going to win, don't you? Well, very tentatively and hesitatingly, I, I said to Peter, uh, Peter, I, I think the Lord is wanting for us to, 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 to give thanks. And Peter immediately said, oh, I know, I know, Don. He said, um, but I just cannot think of what to give thanks for. Well, then I received some divine inspiration. I said, well, Peter, uh, who was from Poland originally, I said, did you ever play I Spy when you were as a child in Poland? And he knew about the game of I Spy. So I'll tell you what we're going to do, Peter. We're going to look around this room and we're going to use the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the name which is a strong tower which the righteous run into and are safe. And we're going to say, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for whatever we see. I'm going to thank God for. And we're going to take it alternately. So I will say something and then you'll say something. And we'll go on until things change. Well, I started off. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the bed. And Peter said, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this chair. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the window. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this room. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this table. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for my friend. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for a safe journey. Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, after about five or ten minutes of this Thanksgiving, the atmosphere charge started to change. And it's as though the, first, the, the presence of the Lord came down in an invisible cloud in that very room. And Peter, you know, started to smile. After about 20 minutes of us thanking God in this way, uh, and we did thank God for the uh, poached egg on toast that we'd received and how delicious it was and how friendly people were in the conference. Um, but Timothy, uh, but Peter started almost to dance. He wanted to dance. He was up on his feet, smiling, radiating the joy of the Lord. And I could say it didn't change. I said good night to Peter and he went off and had a lovely night's sleep. And when he woke up in the morning, he said to me, uh, as we met, you know, he met with a greasy morning dawn and thank the Lord Jesus Christ for this wonderful uh, sunny day and thank you for a good night's sleep. And, and we were off again starting to thank the Lord. There is power in thanksgiving and I just want to encourage you to all to take part in that ministry. And then the third prison ministry that Paul had, verse 4, the ministry of praying. You know, one of the very best things we can do for anyone is to lift them up to the throne of Almighty God, place them lovingly and tenderly into God's everlasting arms. Philemon and his family, thousands of miles away from Paul, but Paul could touch them in prayer. And one way God answered was to bring Paul a friend from the house of Philemon. Almighty God put it in the heart of Onesimus to run away and travel hundreds of miles uphill and down dale over mountains and sea to get to Paul, the man he must have heard about in his master's home, the man he believed had all the answers for life's problems. Paul was a man of prayer and his prison shackles and chains and prison doors on the Roman guard couldn't prevent him, his prayers reaching the throne of God in heaven. Paul could talk to Almighty God and bring down his blessing and favour Prayer is powerful. And not only that, as a very wise king, Solomon said, the prayer of the upright is God's delight. When you open your lips to talk to God, do remember, as you say your prayers tonight, that you are bringing great delight to the creator of this awesome, wonderful universe. It's wonderful, isn't it? I thank my God, making mention of you always, in my prayers. And then Paul's fourth prison ministry, the ministry of encouragement and exhortation. Verse 5, hearing of your love and faith, 
which you have towards the Lord Jesus and toward all the believers, the saints. I've heard about your love and your faith, says St Paul. Even here in a Roman prison, hundreds of miles from you, do people talk about our love and faith hundreds of miles from where we live? Their love and faith, the love they had for Jesus and for all the saints, were talking qualities. And they were talked about by Paul in his prison cell. Now these qualities are needed for effective evangelism. And Paul gives them the key in verse 6 for successful evangelism, that the communication of your faith may become effectual. And don't want we all want the communication of our faith in Jesus to become effectual? Well, Paul says that we make it effectual by acknowledging every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus. Now, from my experience, Christians are very good at acknowledging all the bad things about themselves. But Paul says, if you want to be an effective evangelist, start acknowledging, start confessing, start talking about all the good things you have in Christ. We have the Lord's divine presence every step of the way. He will never leave us or forsake us. We have his word which cannot be broken. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And I love Romans 5 verse 5. I paraphrase it. We have the perfect, never-failing love of Almighty God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit himself. We have the mind of Christ. We have rivers of living water flowing from our inmost being. Do you believe it? We can be a tremendous blessing when we do. Verse 7. Or even Paul the aged in prison, in a dark, dank dungeon prison cell, it said, had, verse 7, great joy and consolation in their love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by Philemon. Do you get the feel-good factor when you enjoy the fellowship of true believers? Does it do something for you in your guts? God's word says it, verse 7, the bowels of the saints are refreshed by you, brother. Ministry Number five, leading people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the scene in that dark, dank dungeon of a Roman prison cell? Paul chained hands and feet, but his blessing and thanking God and praising and praying and exhorting, when suddenly Onesimus, the runaway slave, turns up. What took you so long? I've been praying for you, Onesimus. Onesimus must have heard about Paul in his master's house and wanted desperately to meet him. And he'd risked his very life and limb to travel over 1,200 miles on foot to reach Paul. And what does Paul do? He sends him back to his master Philemon. Verse 9, for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Paul can't be out evangelising. So what does the Sovereign Lord do? He brings people to Paul. I feel that Paul must have written this with a wry smile. Your slave, Philemon, I got him saved while I was in bonds in prison. And what about Paul's sixth prison ministry? The ministry of making merry. There is a saying, isn't there, uh, uh, as miserable as sin. And in this sad and sorry world, we need to keep a merry heart. I believe that happiness 
and holiness go together. A merry heart does good like medicine, said a very wise man, King Solomon, Proverbs 17, verse 22. And Proverbs 15, 15 says, A merry heart is a continual feast. Psalm 2 tells us that God himself laughs. Paul must have smiled to himself as he makes a pun on the name Onesimus. Onesimus means useful, and Paul makes a play on his name. Onesimus, in time past, was not useful. He was useless. But now is Onesimus useful to thee and to me, Philemon. A useless slave becomes a useful brother thanks to the prison ministry of Paul the aged, chained in a dark, dank dungeon of a Roman prison cell. And then what was St Paul's seventh prison ministry? The ministry of giving. One would have been so useful to Paul in prison. Verse 13, I would have liked to have kept one Isimus, who would have ministered me in the bonds of the gospel. But Paul is so selfless when we can be so selfish, so self-centred. We need to put others first. You know what joy is, don't you? Joy, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. We cannot really enjoy the blessings of the promised land until we're prepared to leave our inheritance, cross over the River Jordan and fight with and alongside our brothers until they enter into their inheritance. But it's so rare. How often do we see it? Do you know, I've been so... I've seen so much jealousy in churches... If we aren't guilty of burying our own talents, we can soon find others to do it for us. There's often a Saul in a church, isn't there, who will throw a javelin into the back, or an Ataliah who will kill all who th are a threat to her ambitions. A jealousy when we should rejoice in each other's gifts. We need each other. How Saul would have prospered with a fighter like David to kill his thousands, tens of thousands. Well, Paul, chained in a prison cell, considers others. And don't we see the cross of Christ in Paul's life? Onesimus, who is my very self, I am sending him back to you, Philemon. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that you should receive him forever. Not now a servant, but a brother servant, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more unto you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If you count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. I love Romans 15 verse 7. Welcome one another, receive one another, greet one another as Jesus has welcomed you for the glory of God. And then prison ministry number eight, writing letters or sending emails of encouragement, exhortation and blessing. Paul probably never knew uh, how much his letters from prison would be used by God to bless not hundreds, but millions. This little short letter of Philemon, written from prison in Paul's own hand, is still being a blessing to the body of Messiah. Millions have been blessed by that short letter. It didn't take him half an hour to write, perhaps. Verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. No computer or email, but this handwritten letter has reached millions. It's the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. 
If he have wronged thee or oweth thee or put that on my account, says St. Paul. Isn't that so Christ-like? Jesus became poor that we may come, might become rich. Yes, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt do more than I say. Isn't it great to have confidence in our Christian brothers that they will do more than we ask? Prepare me a lodging, says St. Paul. And, verse, and then in verse 22, Paul expresses this ninth prison ministry of encouragement. Be strong in faith, believe and confess. I trust that through your prayers, Philemon, I shall be given unto you. I'll be released. Isn't it great to show faith in our fellow believers' prayers? Your prayers will be answered and prepare for them to be answered. We we'll reveal our faith to God by preparing our, for our prayers to be answered. And we must remember that it, it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then prison ministry number 10, the ministry of saluting, verse 23. Salute Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Salute Marcus, Aristarchus, Dinus, Lucas, my fellow laborers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I think it's good to acknowledge one another. We are soldiers in Christ. We're in a battle. We're meant to be moving forward, shoulder together, together in this battle, to be led in victory in Messiah. Notice this letter ends with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't perform any of these tremendous ministries without the Lord and his grace and the power of his Holy Spirit. But when we do, then he'll pour out of our lives. Many of us, I believe, can feel imprisoned by circumstances, by illness, by difficult relationships, by a boring job, by disability. But if Paul the aged, imprisoned and bound and chained, could fulfil at least ten prison ministries of blessing, thanksgiving, prayer, holy laughter, exhortation, teaching, leading people to faith in Jesus, writing letters to encourage and bless others, saluting other soldiers in Messiah, then we can too. May you excel in all these ministries to the glory of God. Amen.